chapter number 19 is where we're going to spend our time. Now, uh, the lectionary passage actually gives us the Matthean account in Matthew chapter 21. And as I was reading all three versions of this uh, account of Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, uh, you know, Matthew had its account uh, that was, you know, very powerful and compelling. Mark had his account that was very powerful and compelling. And Luke had his account that was very powerful and compelling. And uh, I, I landed on the Luke account because I always appreciate the universality of the way Luke tells the story of Jesus ministry in the world. Luke reminds us as one of the last gospels of the three synoptics written that the message of Jesus is relevant to everyone. There is indeed a particular revelation of God in Christ in the world and that this message crosses every single barrier that we may create or that may be real. That Jesus is relevant to the believer and the unbeliever. Jesus is relevant to the rich and the poor. Jesus is relevant to the leader and the follower. Jesus is relevant to all of creation. And there is a power in the universality of the message of Jesus. That Jesus can fit in any one of our circumstances and be right at home. Oh, I don't know if you appreciate the gift of that assumption, of that presupposition that Jesus is at home in every circumstance. And if Jesus is at home in every circumstance, then I want to be around the one who is always at home wherever they are. There's something great about being, about being around folk who aren't easily shook. Uh, Yes, who aren't easily uh, thrown into a, a conundrum of sorts. Because I'm one of these folk that can get knocked off my post at particular moments of my life with, a, you know, not a lot of effort. Amen. Amen. You say the wrong thing and it, it's going to be a problem. Amen. I see the people I love being harmed is going to be a problem. Amen. You know, if, I, if, 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 if my toe hurt on a certain day, it's going to be a problem. But ain't it great to know that we serve a God who anticipates every problem and has already figured out a solution. Luke chapter number 19 then is the account of Jesus entry into Jerusalem. Jerusalem sitting 3,800 feet high above sea level. Jesus having to make a journey on foot to the city of Jerusalem, a city set on a hill. The scripture says Jesus had to set his face to Jerusalem. And on the way, Jesus, you know, may have got tired or Jesus may have said, you know what, it's time for me now to let people know who is coming back to Jerusalem. And we'll pick up chapter number 19 of Luke, verse 28. Hopefully it's on your screen. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And the scripture says this, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As Jesus approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. Man, Jesus sending his uh, ragtag band of followers to go jack somebody's transportation. Oh, uh, amen. Don't, 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 don't ever think, amen, that Jesus didn't have a little gangster in him, amen. Jesus, Jesus, you know, sent his folk out here to go get somebody's ride, amen. Uh, uh, verse 31, and if anyone asks you why are you untying it, say the Lord needs it. Don't you try this at home. I know we're in a crisis, praise God, but don't you go taking stuff that's not yours talking about Jesus told me the Lord needs it. Amen. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as Jesus told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you stealing, I mean, untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. Verse 35, then they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on it. And as Jesus went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. And when he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles 
they had seen. Lord, I could preach right there on that one phrase. Because even as Jesus is approaching his greatest challenge, he has death ahead of him. There was enough in the past that still caused the people to praise Jesus for what Jesus had already done. It wasn't going to take away the challenge Jesus was, go Jesus was going to endure, but it was enough for them to be able to remind Jesus and maybe even themselves that even as this is approaching, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven, glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd, you know, you got haters everywhere, said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Last few verses, as Jesus approached Jerusalem, saw the city, he wept over it. And said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you. Him you in on every side, they will dash you to the ground. You and the children within your walls, they will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. These are some powerful verses and passages that I hope you spend some time for the rest of the next couple of days thinking and reflecting on. Uh, I, I'm going to try and, and weave some of this together and give us a bit of some insight about the ride and die king that we serve. A ride and die king that we serve. God, we thank you for the word that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide your word in our heart so we will not sin against you and let the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy rest upon me and even the hearers of your word and we'll say thank you, God. In Jesus' name, we pray. Let the people of the way at home just type amen right there in your comments. Amen, amen. Type in the ride and die king. Amen. Jesus is a rider. Amen. Jesus also is willing to die, but he still is at all times the king. Now, as we gather on this penultimate Sunday before Easter, in the age of Corona, I can say with confidence that it is not lost upon us why we need to be reminded that death does not have the final say. Say that to yourself. Death does not have the final say. It does not have the final say. Even more than any other Lenten and now Easter season in our lifetime, we are acutely aware of the presence of death. It has become a global and communal experience. Its presence has been ubiquitous, yet concrete. It's been ominous, yet delayed on its own schedule, if you will. Widespread, yet particular, meeting us all at different points of our family, friends, uh, community. Just last week, my brother was, was, was very, very sick unto death and, and, and just so grateful uh, that he was, was pulled back from the brink, amen, of his sickness. And yet we know that uh, so many others uh, had to uh, give way to this terrible, terrible illness and death uh, seemed to have gotten the final victory. As members of the body of Christ universal, uh, a body and an ecclesia that knows no time or place, it is indeed rare, if not unprecedented, that we all get to feel the same groaning at the same time. Our liturgical calendars offer some structure for a shared life of worship, 
a shared process of meaning making. We, we share time together as a global church. But because of all of our particular geographic, uh, geopolitical context, uh, one part of the country could be experiencing a ravaged war and genocide, while another part of the country could, or world could be experiencing an amazing economic uh, uh, situation. One part of the country could be going through a, a, a massive natural disaster, while a whole other part of the country <clears throat> is experiencing one of the most beautiful uh, uh, seasons of, of autumn or spring or summer. And so it is not often that all of us at one time, as the world or as the global church, can participate in this shared moment of grief and, and, and discomfort and challenge. We live at the intersections of many tug and pull realities. Even on this Sunday, that is considered Palm Sunday, <clears throat> some of us in our liturgical spaces, we acknowledge this as Passion Sunday. And so we see, again, this dichotomy, this, this seemingly uh, 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 stretched reality of a tension between the palms and the passion. Some of us know that Easter and resurrection are on the way, but we feel the results and the, 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 the concreteness of corona right here in our moment. And even on today, as we celebrate the Eucharist, the, the Holy Sacrament, we remember the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus, we are indeed in real time handling a broken body. And we are are feeling and seeing and witnessing the shedding of blood all across the spectrum of the body of Christ universal. It's caused me to think very deeply about what does it mean to be the embodied church of Jesus? One that is both living and dead. One that is both universal and particular. One that is at the same time afflicted and healed. What does it mean to bear the grief of a fallen and broken world? Maybe the, the, the uncertainty of your own home or, or, or community or relationships, all while lifting up the hope and expectation of the new that Jesus' arrival has signaled to all creation has emerged. Like holding the tensions and the contradictions is for us who are human, the heaviest of crosses to bear, and it is exactly what Jesus had to do for much of his life. <clears throat> I mean, we must appreciate that Jesus, as he sets his face to Jerusalem, had to know this day was coming. From the earliest of his conscious moments as a human being, Jesus knew that there was a journey he had to undertake that even though he was eternal in his essence, he was limited by the finitude of his humanity. And with eternity in Jesus' mind, made limited by the confines of his human body, Jesus' whole life must have been a persistent toil to hold together contradiction. And while you and I won't know the depths of Jesus' struggle to hold that stuff together, how many of you know even right now you are learning what it means to hold both hope and despair together? You have a tug of war going on in your own mind. In your body, in your home, in your marriage, in your relationship, with your uh, uh, money, with your, your children, with, with all of these things that are material in nature. We are experiencing the same tension that Jesus had to literally carry his whole life multiplied by infinity. I want you to know Holy Week offers you and I a powerful, powerful glimpse at the journey Jesus had to undergo. Not because we're masochists as Christians. 
No, we are not people looking for suffering. But we are a people who can testify that life and history through the lens of Jesus has taught us that suffering is redemptive. It can be exchanged for some life. And this is where I find this particular text and juxtaposition of Jesus, the tension of Jesus as a ride and die king. You know, some of us who are deeply steeped in the culture, amen, hood culture, rap culture, any kind of culture, amen, hip hop to the hip hop, skibbity bop, and all, the, all that kind of stuff. We, 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 we're clear about ride or die type folk. Amen. You know, growing up, you know, you'd be like, are you riding or no? Nah? Amen. It's riding or no. Nah. It ain't riding and no. Nah. It's like you got to make a choice. Are you riding? <clears throat> I mean, the most iconic uh, 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 example of this I can think of is the boys in the hood or menace. It was boys in the hood. Or, yeah, it was boys in the hood that when 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 Trey, you know, you know, and Doughboy was getting ready to go and 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 make up some 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 stuff that was happening, you know, and 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 Trey snuck out his daddy's house and hopped in the car with Doughboy, and they on their way to you know handle some business, as they say, and Trey and them get, come up to a stop sign, and 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 Trey just calmly says, "Let me out," and Doughboy looks at him, said, "Let me out." Doughboy, you know, you know, pulled to the side, let him out. That was a riding or nah situation. Mm -hmm. That often in these moments, you will be given a dichotomous choice, a choice between two polarities, yes or no, a binary that is not often giving you the space to have the full expression of human experience. And yet we find a Savior on his way to Calvary, experiencing and demonstrating that it is possible to have a ride and die mentality. That Jesus is not picking or choosing when Jesus will be with you. Jesus ain't just riding in the good times and disappearing in the bad times. And Jesus ain't just showing up when everything is going sideways and not nowhere to be around when you're experiencing some of your highest heights. No, Jesus is riding and dying with you and I at the same time maintaining his transcendent power and function in our lives as the one who can do anything but fail. Now, it's important. I love, uh, you know, whenever we come in the first week of April, I always reflect on Dr. Martin Luther King because, you know, his assassination has continued to be one of these shadows that have hung over our country for quite some time, at least 53 some, some years. And, and I remember, uh, you know, reading uh, Dr. King's uh, final sermon, at least the title and an excerpt that came from his last speech in Memphis entitled, Why America May Go to Hell. And I want to offer these words to you. They may hop up on your screen because I do think this juxtaposition, if you will, of Jesus as the ride and die king uh, gives you and I an opportunity to juxtapose Jesus' form of leadership uh, over and against the way the empire many of us are so loyal to has failed to be a ride and die society. Dr. King says it like this, and I come by here to say that America too is going to hell if she doesn't use her wealth, if America does not use her vast resources of wealth to end poverty and make it possible for all of God's children to have the basic necessities of life, she too will go to hell. I know you ain't never heard this part of Dr. King before. Amen. You like the I have a dream and, you know, you know, all these other niceties. Amen. But Dr. King goes on to say, and I hear and I will hear America through her historians years and generations to come saying we built gigantic buildings to kiss the skies. We built gargantuan bridges to span the seas. And through our spaces, we were able to carve highways through the stratosphere, through our airplanes. We are able to dwarf distance and place time in chains. Through our submarines, we were able to penetrate oceanic depths. 
It seems that I can hear the God of the universe saying, even though you have done all of that, I was hungry. And you fed me not. I was naked and you clothed me not. The children of my sons and daughters were in need of economic security and you didn't provide it for them. And so you cannot enter the kingdom of greatness. This may well be the indictment on America. I find these words to be a necessary prophetic correction to the way in which even in this moment we are experiencing the failure of our country to be ride and die to those who are most impacted and vulnerable. Because for many of us, we had a catastrophe long before we had a pandemic. And the pandemic is now exacerbating a catastrophe. A catastrophe that some in power are slow to acknowledge publicly, but behind the scenes have seen to figure out how to profit from privately. That they are indeed sharing information, particularly about these masks, making us believe you didn't need a mask. But now we know they're telling everybody get a mask. And now they're telling us uh, that you should just use anything. And, you know, I'm one of these harm reduction type folks, so I believe anything is better than nothing. But I do believe that those who are most vulnerable should not be left to anything while those with wealth and power get the best that is available. That is not ride and dying. That is choosing whose life is worthy to live. And this characterizes a totally different approach of leadership that Jesus turned on its head. When you look at the life of Jesus, Jesus lived and served and surrendered, and even he died in a way that left no life uncovered. I love how we sing a song back in the day that said, to the utmost, Jesus says. But then he said, have another little, little just, you know, you know in, in old black church, you know, we, we would, we would uh, have a little remix of any kind of song. Say, then to the guttermost, amen, just in case some of, some of us, you know, couldn't identify the utmost yet. Amen. If Jesus had to go down to the gutter, I wish I had some gutter saints up in here today. Amen. It's not not the heights by which you have uh, uh, sat. It's the depths that which you have come from that help define the power of God. You ought to just type, type in your chat. He brought me from a mighty long way. Amen. He brought me down. I was deep sinking in sin, but the master of the sea. Lord, I'm getting too excited and it's still too early. Uh, But I want you to know that this Jesus frees us. And that is the, the first point of this ride and die king. We serve a ride and die king whose priority is to free us. And I want you to appreciate in this passage, verse number 30, it says that Jesus tells his disciples, you will find a colt tied there, untie it and bring the colt to me. While it may be obvious that Jesus freed a colt, I love that Jesus in the story is not just freeing human beings. That freedom modeled by Jesus frees all of creation. That everything created, even a colt, even a donkey, needs to be touched by the freeing power of God. That there is indeed a power that can free every single created thing. That is the depth of this ride and die king that Jesus frees. Jesus wants to bring freedom and liberation to not just you, but everything around you. That your freedom can't be so radically individual that you ignore the way we are bound in our environment, bound in our labor force, Bound in our economic conditions, 
No, there is a freedom that will happen in your spirit and in your soul, but there's also a freedom that must happen in your body and in our community and in our politics, a freedom that leaves no one behind. And this is a moment where you and I must remind ourselves that even while we are struggling with our own apparent bondage, that we can't be free unless all of us are free. And that's a hard lesson for many of us who like to pick and choose who gets to be free. But I'm finding that in moments of crisis, all the things you thought separated you don't really matter as much. If you know in a moment of crisis that even your worst enemy can save your life, you'll put your beef to the side. And you'll say, you know what? Maybe we'll pick up this fight another day. But today, freedom is our priority. It is important to then appreciate and identify what are the things that keep us in bondage? What are the things that keep you and I in this moment from truly belonging to one another? Here at The Way, we've been talking about belonging. And I remember when we first brought this to our leadership team in January, we had a whole uh, leadership retreat, and we talked about belonging. And I was just feeling in my spirit that we had to begin to teach and train and form our church and our community around a spirit and a way of life that is grounded in belonging. Bridging differences and things that appear to separate us. And in my mind, I could see on the horizon the diabolical nature of the division that was being sown to us by a ride or die wannabe king named Trump or named the American uh, white supremacist leaning sensibility. But, but I found that God was trying to call some of us out of that sensibility and say, how can we practice belonging? Before the rain comes. And little did we know, many of you who are members of the way and other parts of our national networks who've been going down this journey with us, that we had to learn to sit in rooms with people across lines of difference, political differences, differences around uh, our, our, our race and our gender and our sexuality, our, our economic and our religious differences, all these different things that in another time we may have prioritized over our shared humanity. And isn't it something that for many of us, we had to practice learning how freedom must be brought to all of us, or it will not truly bring freedom to ourselves. So the question then you and I must ask ourselves, what has you tied up like this colt or donkey in this story? What are the things that are tying you to a pole when God has need of you? Some of us are holding on to something that God wants to untie us from. An old way of thinking, an old way of being, an old way of seeing. And those things are so limited in nature that you can't fully lean into freedom and liberation. Why is that so important? Because you and I must at every moment of our lives be committed to the freedom and liberation of the soul, the body, the mind, and the spirit. Don't just pick one of the four, two of the four. It's not a multiple choice exam. Well, I think I'm going to choose A and I don't care about B. I'm going to choose C and I don't care about D. There is an E on that question and it's called all of the above. You ought to type in your comments all of the above. I choose freedom and liberation for all of the above and in my choosing. May I then be open to how I myself must be unbound. Often I found in my own journey that the things I am most agitated by in others is often the thing that is binding me in my own life. That's why Jesus said, before you start talking about the little splinter in your Loved ones, I, you got a log in that joint you got that made you a one-eyed wonder. (laughs) 
You ought to tell somebody, you old one-eyed wonder, pull that log out your own eye and get free. The second thing that I love about this text is that Jesus not only frees, but Jesus rides with us. The scripture says that they threw their cloaks on the coat and put Jesus on top of it, and they went along. I love it that Jesus took what was available to him, and he rode it. Jesus rode what was made available to him, which speaks to you and I about our availability. Jesus will ride with you. Sometimes Jesus will be in your trunk, though, and not in the driver's seat. Some of y'all need to put Jesus behind the wheel. Amen. You say, take the wheel, Jesus. Amen. You ought, to, you ought to just say in your chat what you need Jesus to take the wheel for. Amen. Jesus ain't just trying to ride with some of us. Jesus is trying to drive some of us. And in the riding and the driving, Jesus is offering to you and I a whole new way of entering into our lives. This cult, this donkey, was a radical departure of how a a, a king or a, a ruler would enter into a city with triumph and victory as his declaration. Jesus riding on a donkey is declaring that I am coming as a victor, but with a different kind of victory path. I'm not coming on a horse with an army. To overthrow, I'm coming on a donkey with a proposal that will bring peace and prosperity. Ooh, my goodness, isn't that such a departure from how empire, how the, the predatory nature of Western culture seems to offer our path to victory, that in order for you to be victorious, you have to be strong. You have to be a, 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 a agent of violence. You have to use hegemonic force to lord over in order to bring a, a sense of freedom and a sense of a new world order. Jesus says, listen, I understand that the first revolution is an internal revolution. So rather than bringing a revolution that will spill some blood, I'm going to bring a revolution that will be, as Shirley Chisholm called, or a bloodless revolution. Wouldn't it be something if you and I got serious about a bloodless revolution? A revolution that reminded you and I that we don't have to harm one another in order to have a radical transformation of our society. Dr. King said it like this, that our society needs a revival of values. We need a radical transformation of how we prioritize one another, ourselves, our families, our relationships across time and place with creation, with the environment with nations all of us in the world right now are fighting an enemy we can't see but the response listen to me is not a war that requires profit and exploitation that is why i have a great problem with the way we're talking about this donald trump declares himself a wartime president he parades oligarchs and plutocrats and all these ceos and corporate executives and they stand up before the american people and it's obvious that if we are at war we will lose with these folk in charge because they don't know what they're doing. We are not at war. We are undergoing the greatest humanitarian crisis the world has seen in modern history. And the way you respond to a crisis that is humanitarian in nature is not with soldiers and not with tanks, but is with radical generosity. It is with love. It is with helping one another. It is with reminding ourselves that we serve a king who rides on a donkey and not at the helm of a war plane or a tank and you and I who are followers of Jesus even if the whole world wants to go to war we ought to say no we're into a bloodless revolution we're not going to use corona as a reason to discount our loved ones who are in prison our elders who are in churches and in homes and can't afford the kind of treatment and materials no we're going to say that though we perish we will perish together and if we survive, we will survive together. 
but we will not allow ourselves to turn on one another following a leader or a way of life that has even before this crisis came showed us that the way Jesus rides is the way we must live with a commitment to peace, love, hope, and joy. So what then does a peaceful, bloodless revolution look like in the age of corona? It looks like what many of us are doing. It means that we are sheltering in place, but while we shelter in place, we're checking on one another. It means that we are taking time every day to call our neighbor, call our family member. We're discarding the beasts we had in the past. We're learning what does it mean to forgive, what it means to approach this moment of, of, of death and hopelessness with the Jesus-like commitment and compassion that makes us keep riding with a peaceful healing approach. What then is at stake for us when we show up this way? It allows us to be subject to the natural evocation of praise. And that's the last point, that Jesus evokes praise from us. This ride or die king evokes a praise from us. Verse number 38 says, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Verse 40, uh, at the response of the haters who tell Jesus, tell them to stop praising you. They say, or Jesus says, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. I want you to know that being in the presence of the one who has decided from the beginning that I must go through this. I have to go through this struggle and this trial. I love these folks so much that I'm willing to set my face. I'm willing to die to myself. I'm willing to die to my own ego. Can you imagine the kind of ego Jesus had to suppress as the eternal one? The one who was created before the foundation of the world. The one who was there before everything showed up this Jesus had to decide that I'm gonna push this stuff down uh, Philippians chapter number two describes it as the kenosis uh, that he was willing to empty himself uh, of all of his privilege uh, and authority this Jesus uh, he says that I'm willing uh, to ride with you and as you get in the presence of the Jesus uh, who's willing to be in your presence uh, even in the midst of your greatest obstacle uh, this Jesus knows how to pull a praise out of you he knows how to pull something out of you you didn't even know existed uh, the, 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 the psalmist says that praise is comely on the righteous uh, it means that it fits it, 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 it is natural uh, I remember when I was going through this playoff season with uh, the 49ers uh, and you know I started to go to the games because uh, we were winning praise God uh, and ain't nothing like being in an audience when you are winning uh, now I had to sit through the Super Bowl uh, and up to about six minutes left in the game we were winning uh, nobody had to tell me uh, how to respond when we were winning uh, because there was a certain kind of evocation of praise uh, a certain kind of joy and of bullions uh, I didn't have to get coached into it uh, I didn't have to get primed into it uh, when the when the touchdown happened uh, my whole body went into cataclysmic sh I started running and jumping uh, because I was in the presence uh, of an apparent victory uh, I want you to know that even in the age of corona uh, we're going to deal with some apparent losses uh, some real time losses uh, we're going to shed a tear uh, and we're going to cry uh, but there is a day coming uh, when you and I uh, will get back to a place uh, where we will be in the presence uh, of victory uh, and when the victory comes uh, Jesus said uh, I will bring it out of you uh, just being in my presence uh, you are gonna holler Hosanna blessed be the rock uh, blessed be the one uh, who comes in the name of the Lord uh, you won't need a coach uh, you won't need no directions uh, this instrument 
comes without directions. It's already on the inside of you. And Jesus said it like this. If you try to hold it back, the very rocks will cry out. I'm here to tell you, I don't need no rock crying out for me. Even if I have to cry, I'm going to make sure I'm crying to the one who can help me. I'm crying to the one who can heal me. I'm crying to the one who can lift me. Jesus evokes a praise. I will bless the Lord with tears in my eyes. I will bless the Lord with my questions and my concerns. I will bless the Lord. Why? Because resurrection is on the way. We going through a week where we can see the breaking of day. We can see that resurrection is coming. So while you go through the journey, just keep telling yourself, resurrection, Easter morning, it's coming. I'm going to cry all the way, but I'm going to keep telling myself, resurrection is coming. I'm going to hold the tension, but I'm going to stay in the presence of the one who can bring victory, who can bring power. Shout hallelujah. Resurrection, victory, power is what evokes the muscle memory praise that is buried under our despair. And I'm not asking you to ignore the challenge of this moment. I'm asking you every day, set up a muscle to remind yourself what does it mean to bless the Lord. Don't let your muscle of praise get atrophied in the age of corona. We're bringing up other muscles of, of, of lament. I welcome that. We've been teaching on that. It's an important muscle. But lament is not the only muscle, just like praise and worship is not the only muscle. Let's cultivate these muscles together. If Jesus, knowing that death was before him, was willing to allow the miracles of his own life and that which he performed for others be a catalyst for worship, adoration, and praise. Then what does it mean for you and I to let this moment be the same opportunity? God, I will praise you. I will praise you even when it seems, it feels, and it is apparent that death is at my front door. I will learn to let the praises of God be on my lips. And God, I pray that we, your people today, would trust that you, the ride and die king, the one who frees us, the one who rides with us, with a peace and a humility and a radical evacuation of its own privilege. This is the way we will repair our world. We will move with humanitarian sensibilities, not war-like sensibilities, not predatory, not agitation only, but we will say, God, in this moment, I will be generous in my love generous in my forgiveness and I know many of us I'm one of these people I feel like sometimes I, I, I don't have too much more to give but this is where being in the presence of God can expand us and help us live out this season and this moment with an embodied Jesus Jesus that is made flesh through our activity in the world.